Hey everyone, we're live at KCDC. I'm Jim Bennett, Head of Developer Advocacy at Pieces, and I'm here with a couple of great friends, Heather and Ben, to talk about metrics in DevRel. So, Heather, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, I'm Heather Downing. I'm one of the organizers of KCDC. I've been doing stuff with tech and code for about 15 years, and I previously was um, in developer relations in Okta, and now I run my own startup. So. Nice. Ben, introduce yourself. Sure. Uh, I'm Ben. I'm the uh, head of DevRel at a company called Archit. It's a startup, so it's uh, a new thing for me. I used to be DevRel at uh, Auth0 by Okta, so that's actually where Heather and I met. Mm -hmm. I'm very lucky to be the husband of one of the organizers of KCDC. So that's, that's kind of cool. Um, and yeah, so I've been, been in the DevRel space for about six years now. Awesome. awesome. So we're here to talk about metrics. And yeah. obviously, we've worked in big companies, small companies, you know, Arcjet, I'm guessing. Small startup, you said? Very small. I'm number five. Number five, yes. Okay. Pieces small, we're kind of in the, the mid 20s. Okta, Auth0 was at one massive. Point, thousands. At one point, thousand. a team was like 25 to 30 just in DevRel. Yes, yeah. in DevRel. And then we, I mean, my goodness, the amount of developers that were using our product was huge. Um, we were directly competing with Microsoft, so definitely large. Yeah, very big. And obviously, I was at Microsoft, and that was even bigger 200 mm. or 40,000 people, yeah. or whatever it is. You know, hundreds of people in DevRel teams, millions of developers. So we've kind of got this experience across both sizes of company, big and small. Um, so yeah, we're here to talk about metrics, which is obviously very important for developer relations. There's been a number of companies that have been laying off DevRel folks because they can't justify their existence. Right. And a lot of that comes down to, to metrics. So, Or probably in their case, a lack of metrics. A lack of metrics, right. yes. We can't justify what we do. We can't justify why you need to pay us mm. all this money, fly us around the world, give us access to video platforms, what have you. Yeah. So I think kind of the first question we should touch on really is, what are the metrics that we care about as developer relations? When we say metrics, what do we actually mean? <laughs> and this is the hard question in DevRel, isn't it? What do we mean? Uh, going back to your earlier point of startup small small companies versus the larger ones, mm. it depends on what your goal is. And there are many ways you can measure things, but is your goal to just get people to hear about you, which is what I'm focusing on at the moment? Or is it to a population of developers who already know about you, but you want uh, to actually I don't know, qualify them through the sales pipeline? Yes. Not that we're in sales, but there is that follow-on to that. So what is the goal is the first thing you need to work out before you know what to measure. Or what if they do know about you, but they don't know the new options you have, or you have a, a huge um, drop rate. Like once somebody actually goes in there, you don't know why they're no longer using your products. Um, oftentimes the question is, is it the quality of the educational content, which of course falls to DevRel a lot of the times, so not always, but a lot mm -hmm. of the time. And who is responsible for engaging with them and asking them, why did you stop working with this? And that often also falls to DevRel. Sometimes it is product, it depends on which group you are aligned under, if it's marketing or product or even engineering, what you care about is going to change. Right, yeah. So there's a great quote from Kelsey Hightower. He was asked, you know, what is DevRel? And it's really, DevRel is whatever the people paying you want it to be. So yeah. it's kind of fundamentally, it's different in company to company to company. There is no one strict definition, is sure. there? Um, so I, I like to think a lot in terms of the DevRel journey. I don't know if you've come across this from DevRel Agency. The idea we have of discover, so that's the awareness, the real top of the funnel, how do people learn about you? And then there's um, evaluates, they look at how useful the product is. Learn, they do like their hello world. Build, they do an MVP. And then scale, which is where they take it and run it in production. Sure. So really, DevRel is kind of, to me, it's thinking about how do we enable people to get across that journey as quickly as possible? Mm -hmm. And depending on where you are, that aligns very differently as to different parts of that journey. So Ben, you're saying about startups, it's the biggest thing is driving that awareness. So the biggest thing there is that discover. If we can't get them into the funnel to start with, then how do we get people to see it? How do we get people to actually use the product, put it into production? How do businesses actually monetize it? At the end of the day, the company's gonna have to make money somehow. So we've got to get them into the startup funnel. And I still remember somebody once asked me, um, what is DevRel in a startup like? And I said, have you heard of the sales funnel? And they said, yes, I understand the sales funnel. I said, well, imagine the sales funnel is actually hanging from a rope at the top of the, the ceiling here. And what you're doing is you're taking developers and you're giving them a ball and you're asking them to shoot. Like, and then you walk away and you don't know whether they'll actually make it. Sometime in the future, they might actually get into that funnel. But the more they know about that funnel, 
the more they're likely to try and shoot their shot. Okay, that's an interesting analogy. Because right at the beginning, it's so vague. It's like, here's something you might want to use, and they're like, oh, that's kind of cool, I'll check it out. And but, that's all you know, that's contact number one, right? Yeah. Right, contact, like touch points. Yeah. Touch points, yes, I know that this is a very big thing for you, the concept of touch points. So when you talk about touch points in Devra, what do you mean by that? How do they help with metrics? Well, sometimes you are somebody who becomes friends with everybody that you meet the first time you meet them, but oftentimes it's that, oh, I saw them at this event, or I saw them at my local laundromat and you just said hello and that's a touch point but you don't actually have any relationship with that person but you saw them in passing you might say oh i see this database company in passing now you know they exist then you see them in another events or you hear about them on youtube you're like oh there's that thing and then usually about touch point four or five then they go what is it what do they really do what are they really here for and so what when was that effective the first time you met them or the first time you decided to engage in a relationship with that person? And which do you measure? And the answer is both. Yes. How do you do that when, if it's so passive that you have no idea? Most people don't want to give you their information if you've never met them before. Uh, I don't want your phone number if you're just somebody who I see at a laundromat. And I, I don't know if we're going to be good friends. Yeah. And, and developers are not keen on being like, here's all the, my sign up information. If I don't even know if I like your product or even what you do, and so instead of being sold to, often they're like, ah, well, when I need something, I'll come find you. Mm -hmm. But how do you prove that we were out there to even be able to be contacted, right? And that's that's the big question for metrics there. Yeah, so for example, I gave a talk yesterday on APIs, not related to the product that Pieces produces, and I mentioned I'm head of different Pieces. And some people said, what is Pieces? Oh, this is what we do. And I'm not there on stage selling Pieces, I'm there to talk about a tech topic. So I haven't made a sale or anything like mm -hmm. that, I've just made that connection. And then maybe they'll come to that conference, for example, which we'll be at, and they'll go, oh, Pieces. I remember that guy um, from Pieces talking about this thing. Maybe I should go and connect to the booth. And then, so how do we tie that back to, Jim was at KCDC, that had value. And to so say the answer is, we kind of can't really tie that back because there's no way of tracking that. Right. Which leads me on to a, another question I want to ask you is, yeah, a lot of us will do things like UTM codes. So I'll give a talk and I'll put up a QR code that mm -hmm. links to a UTM code for pieces that happen in my, my particular case. And then we can track that these people scanned Jim's QR code. But of course, that's not everyone. Some people just might have seen it and just will Google pieces or will see the, the logo somewhere or the next time we do it. So how do you think in terms of if we get 10 people scanning our QR code, how do you feel that actually ties back to the number of touch points they hit. Is that a good way to, to guesstimate that? Or is it just a... For me, for me right now, it's really easy. Because okay. you're the only one. Because, well, I'm the only one, but also <laughs> it depends again on the scale of your company. So yes. when I was at, at All Zero, it was very hard because you would get, I don't know, I'm making numbers up, 10,000 signups in an hour. So if there are 20 more from my talk, who knows which 20 they were. Yeah. Whereas if within an hour or two after I give a talk at a conference, there are 10 signups, there's a higher cor correlation there that it was due to the fact that we heard about it through me. So you can tie it back more easily if the... the timing? Uh, well, you can do it on timing as well, absolutely. But also if the... I'm not quite sure how to say this, but the, the difference between your usual load of signups mm -hmm. versus the change. So you see if a your, spike. If your diff is higher, yeah. um, percentage-wise, it's easier to spot. And also as well, you can use like location-based IP tracking. So sorry to get a little bit creepy you know, um, with tracking, but if you have good um, SEO, good metrics, you've, right. got, you've got Google Analytics or whatever, you can kind of see where in the world people are. So, so if there is people going to ArcJet's website from Kansas City, mm -hmm. we can say, well, that was probably, probably. from KCDC. Yeah. And that's a good point because it could have come out of the talk, could have come out of a conversation mm -hmm. at the attendee party. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a couple of ways you can force it, right? You can say, the only way you get to sign up for this is by telling us how you hear, heard about us. Oftentimes, it'll, the answer is uh, a search engine. Yeah. Or yeah. maybe now it's ChatGPT. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> yes. uh, but you can force that. But oftentimes, people don't care about the question, and so they'll just they'll skip it or put other, and, and that's not really good. Yeah. No. You can incentivize it mm. instead of forcing it and saying, you will get credits for your product if you find a DevRel person to give them to you. 
and that works really well. I know that Vonage does that, mm -hmm. and so then they're like, oh, I need another one of these, and like, and then they ask you, what are you using it for? And then you get more qualified, and then like, oh, let me just hand you off to somebody who does like accounts for that, even though you haven't signed anything. They're the ones who can answer your questions, so now your leads are incredibly qualified because they actually went through your demo website. Yeah, so there's, there is that incentive there, whether mm -hmm. it's a discount or a prize or something, mm -hmm. come through me, and then we track that DevRog qualified lead. And I guess it's kind of starting to align with the sales funnel where you have sales qualified leads, marketing qualified leads. And again, the idea, if you can put um, tag those customers in your CRM system as DevRog qualified leads, you've suddenly got an instant show of value. Right. Yes. Yeah, here is a thousand customers who are DevRog qualified leads, and we can show that these customers, their organizations have signed up for this enterprise contract for a million dollars. Give me a big fat bonus. Thank you very much. Yeah, kind of have that a qualification there. Totally. I'm very much in favor of the bonus. Yes. I, love it. <laughs> <laughs> I was just thinking that there's also, how do we know it's worth it to put money into something that is uh, more awareness driven, passive? That means we don't get to collect that lead. They just see our name on a website or they see it actually it's, it's very similar to people who do um, big billboards on the side of the road yes there's been so many studies as to whether or not signs work and of course the answer is they do you don't know who they are but mm -hmm. eventually when you ask them how would you hear about us they're like I saw your billboard on the side of the road but there was an initial investment and trust that that billboard was going to work yeah. and that is the metric that I think companies who've never had DevRel before miss is that if nobody even knows you exist, you can't even start to track leads. Right. Mm -hmm. There is some trust about how to market, and marketing has changed dramatically yes. from what it used to be. That means that traditional print media doesn't work on developers, it just doesn't. Although every year in a Las Vegas Sumtech conference does it in the elevator at the airport, and you're like, yeah, but that nobody is looking at that. <laughs> <laughs> Not in our group. but. So it's the same kind of thing. That's why you would choose to be a sponsor at a conference. That's why you would choose to just throw your um, advertising power behind some influencers and say, we're going to sponsor their blog, their podcast. Mm -hmm. And they will give you a little bit more information, but you don't necessarily always know when someone's willing to pull the trigger. So there has to be some investment of, of the initial. But then you have to say, did that work? How do you qualify, did that billboard in this case, it could just be hosting a party and an event tour, whatever. How do you know that worked? And that that comes down to the intrinsic way we are humans. Are people just talking about it in passing to each other? Are they doing it at the events that you go to? Are they doing it at the meetups you go to? Have they even heard about you? That's how you know that it's worth. Mm -hmm. So you, you go to a party, mm -hmm. um, you're wearing a t-shirt from the company at like an attendee party or something and someone says oh I love your product yes that's the kind of thing that helps it work I mean right. for example I was at the, the speaker dinner uh, we had just called KCDC I've got my pieces hat on and there was a guy there said oh that's pieces I love pieces and so it's that kind of shows that the conversations are happening but it's again it's impossible to measure that you kind of get a feel here I'm going to get back from KCDC I'm going to go to uh, the folks at pieces and say yes this is the conversation I had and we can show from that Obviously, the word is getting around. Therefore, DevRel has value. Yeah. But we can't put give them that a on number. A yeah, can't give them give, give sure. a number. We can't quantify that. You you can to a certain extent quantify it if you differentiate between the different kind of conversations you have. If it's uh, we we had a, a, a term at Call Zero of having a uh, meaningful conversation, and mm -hmm. that would be at a booth or at an event or wherever. If I had a meaningful conversation, I'd chalk one up in my mental chalkboard, and I'd be able to go back after and say I spoke to five different people. And here are the types of conversations we had. And they might not be about the product specifically or about my talk, but just wanting to know more, engaging, something that makes a bit more of a, of a human connection as opposed to just can I have a pair of socks or can you stamp by my, um, uh, what do they call bingo. them, the bingo cards. Yeah. Um, so working out whether or not it's qualified. If it's qualified, you can still count them. And they're worth more than just a sideline conversation. Mm -hmm. So you can still turn those into metrics. They're not as valuable in terms of you don't put as much weight onto them when you're evaluating but there is still a number you can derive from it. I mean, you say you don't put enough value on those. It's, in some ways, they're also worth a lot more because if those conversations you're having are with an inf a business influencer in sure. the company, yeah, you're having that meaningful conversation, right. not with one developer who might use your product, but with a engineering manager or CTO who might roll your product out to the entire company. Right. They could actually be incredibly valuable for the, for the, the company conversations that have a strong 
dollar value. Yes. Because although so, DevRel is not sales, we all like to get paid. Right. So, you know. so when, I, when I say you don't put as much weight on them, it's because you can't really qualify every single one of them mm -hmm. as being something that on average they probably will because like you say one of them might turn into a billion dollar rollout yeah. the other one might be somebody says that's really good and then they use a competitor yes so you can't really know where those those meaningful conversations go mm -hmm. but on average you can get a few of them but they might not be worth the same as another kind of engagement mm -hmm. metric um, because of that vagueness yeah there's also a size of the value of the customer right mm -hmm. lots of people might get signups but when do they really engage and create those big bills, right, that gets paid to your company. Yeah. I can tell you right now that if you want the high value people, they are not just going to passively click on things on your website and then give you a million dollars of sales. They want to talk to a human being. Mm -hmm. And anybody in sales will tell you that. They also want to talk to a human. In the beginning, if they just want to suss out what is your tech really capable of, what are the holes, they don't want to talk to a salesperson because they don't trust the answers they're going to get. But if we are not doing sales we're just explaining where this might fit in to what you're doing because you are somebody who has, who has a reputation most of our people I know have a reputation for being architects or and even working at multiple companies in this kind of position which means they are trusted almost intrinsically yeah developers trust us way more than they do um, these people in the sales pipeline because we're not here to sell them we're just here to help them understand help first sell last correct right. and I can tell you that no major um, customer has ever just by themselves decided to yes contact me with the salesperson for more. Mm -hmm. They always will wander by your booth, or they will uh, ask you questions on YouTube, and they'll, they'll 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 really explore. And we are that touch point for that exploration, which means again, it's hard to quantify. And yet, if you want some of those higher value customers. It's so necessary to be able to really engage at that level. The amount of conversations at Okta that I was, they tried to pull me into like, hey, they saw your talk. Yes, we have an SE uh, um, solutions architect that is going to talk to them with sales, but they really want to dig in a little more. Could you just come and talk to them? We're not asking you to sell to them, but they need to understand maybe almost at a workshop level a little bit more, yeah. or maybe you can point to additional content they could see. They, they call us by name. Most of, at some point, they're like, ah, I know this person at Engrock. I know this person over at Pieces, right? Uh, no, they don't know us personally, really, but yet they know of us, mm -hmm. and they would trust what, they, what they're what they hearing from us. It's a really interesting space to be a like a double agent. Yeah, they, they we are authentic in Devra. We are engineers first. We yes. help first, sell last. So yes. they, they want to have that exploratory engineering level conversation with someone who's not going to try and direct them towards some kind of deal. You know, we're just interested in how do we solve their problems, whereas sales are going to be more interested in what size contract am I going to line Correct. up? What do I need to think about in terms of selling the right package to them? So they want to have that touch point with an engineer first. Mm -hmm. And I guess that's thinking about that developer's journey. You know, they discover you at a conference, they evaluate you from the website. When they hit that learn phase, that hello world, that might be that, hey, I want to talk to an engineering person to help me get through the hello world, to help me understand the, the engineering value of it. And then when I think really kind of past build to scale, that scale conversation has to happen with the salesperson. So I can look at what's the right contract I can build right. so that I'm investing. Yeah, I've invested the time in the, in the exploration. Now I'm thinking about investing the money. I need to have that money conversation. Right. And that's the point where DevRel backs out and goes, you know, I'm out of here. <laughs> right. And we, and we teach in the wild in the pub in public so anytime somebody asked me a question I was like this is great I want to tweet about this question so I can answer not just your question maybe many others also have it mm -hmm. solution engineers won't do that they are very much tailored to just your situation mm -hmm. and well but we will get those same questions and the differences we teach in, 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 the, in public yes anything we get and so we will answer questions that sometimes might just be emailed to us publicly Mm -hmm. This is the answer to that so that we can help much more people. And that's just also a little differentiator there, which means that you can technically help the sales pipeline without even realizing it. Yeah, we're scaling through mm. these different touch points that we want to have with a wider group of people. We're not, um, death row is about breadth rather than, than depth, where solution engineers is more of the depth side of things. Correct. The breadth. So for example, um, a friend of mine, um, Brandon, he's here giving a talk on the different AWS services because a question he gets a lot as a DevRel at AWS is, what service do I need for my web app? 
because they all have silly names like Elastic Beanstalk and <laughs> Toilet Bowl or I don't know what they're called. Um, but he, and I think that's a problem that's been identified that people don't know. So rather than just answer on a one-to-one basis, he's like, I'm going to go and put this talk into conferences and talk about the different services to a larger group of people. Mm-hmm. It's not that solution in here on answering one question. It's kind of thinking about that scale all the way through. Yes. So who is that valuable to in terms of an org chart? It's valuable to marketing because that means more about that information is getting out, which leads to top of funnel. Mm -hmm. It's valuable to product because then that means that that's actually feedback that they don't understand what the product is. Mm -hmm. And then it's valuable engineering because based on people trying that, then they can be like, are they using it? Is it breaking? Is it like, is there other features that we could do? differently in our execution of it not just the idea of it because product is much more about the idea of it engineers about the execution so depending on who you report to i always kind of think that developer relations should probably just report to like the cto (laughs) because they touch so many other works but if i were to pick one it would be product because you can you can't educate on a product that's not good. Yes, <laughs> um, yeah. it's definitely a symbiotic relationship with product, marketing, sales, right. engineering. Everybody, yeah. you have to be friends with everybody. But yes. yeah. yeah, different people have different views on it. Marketing is great because they have money. Yep. Product is great because we need to think more about the, the product feedback. And I think um, where we've seen the rise of developer advocacy mm. as opposed to developer evangelism, I think Ben, you were touching this when we were talking earlier. The idea of evangelism is I'm there telling the world about this. It's right. all very outward bound. It's right. all very, I'm advocating to. Whereas developer advocacy thinks a lot about advocating for. Right. So that's how do I take the feedback from our users and how do I bring that back to essentially the product team. I mean, sometimes it's content feedback. You're missing this documentation. But also it is product feedback. Here is a failure with the product. And I want to tell you in a constructive way before you read a million tweets on the internet from someone hating on you. So, yeah, how would you measure the success of that that feedback side of things? See, I think at this point you've actually made your life easier all of a sudden. Because measuring the the value of outreach is hard. Mm -hmm. Because, you, like you say, you're basically shouting into the ether and hoping somebody hears you. Yeah. And actually acts on it. Yes. Whereas when you're talking to people, I've, I've, I've spoken to people at conferences who've said, hey, how do I use this part? Or I've, I've implemented it this way and it's not working for this situation. I can go directly back to the product team and not only can I tell them, I can actually raise uh, an issue in the issue tracker. Mm-hmm. And suddenly there's something that's trackable because it was created by DevRel. So DevRel created issues is something that's really easy to track, not only in terms of the impact that DevRel is having and bringing that back into the product, but also you can reverse that back into the community and say, here's how your feedback to us is helping. Because we've got a timeline now of how quickly they get resolved, mm-hmm. how much we actually listen to the community. So there's so much data happening there because it's all feedback into the system, into a company that already has a system for managing it. So we can say, Ben raised 15 issues. Yep. This is great. Yep. Also, our um, NPS score or whatever kind of satisfaction measurement of the people who raised those issues is, is, is higher, mm-hmm. whether it's just... Um, a quote on your Discord server where they said, oh, this is great, thank you for fixing this, or whatever, you kind of get that anecdata type measurement of the user happiness based off these numbers. Um, And then, I mean, one thing I like to do is I I like to dig into the metrics from the actual product, and you can kind of almost see if we have this this drop-off point because of a, a problem with the product, is that going, is that number going back up? You know, if we would get of 100% of people who use this part of the product, only 60% use this part, we have feedback from customers to say, this is broken, and then we implement that, and suddenly that goes from 100% of customers using this feature, now 80% use this feature. We've got that in our mix panel or other metric system. We've got that, that feedback loop where we can say, we fixed this, this led to this, yeah. thank you very much, I'll have that million dollar bonus there. Now you're going into my favorite part of the developer journey, which is going from developer awareness to developer retention. Mm -hmm. Because they are beyond qualified. They're already your customers. We're not support. Like support is a different group, but you get like DevRel qualified issues saying, yes, we also know how this product works. We see that it's wrong, which means if we are saying you need to fix this, you should probably take what we say and expand it across multiple people, not just one person complaining. That means we have seen it with multiple users that have come to us. Um, And putting your roadmap and issue tracker public is crucial for this. Mm -hmm. Did you, did we hear you? GitHub does a great job of this. Did we hear you about this issue? Yes or no? Um, You could see it right there, whether or not anybody's even acknowledged it. 
if it's put in by somebody in DevRel, you know that it's going to probably get in front of the people who are making decisions in about how much technical debt do we have that we should give to engineering before we give them new features to build. Yeah. Right? Because oftentimes that's, there's a huge disconnect between engineering and product because they've got all these other things to fix and they don't, they're don't they not given the time to do it. And DevRel can also be an advocate for your own internal engineers mm. saying, look, they would love to fix this stuff and this is how it would impact our retention as well. Mm -hmm. So we can say, yes, based on the numbers that we're looking at, we see this drop off here. Yep. Um, so engineers, you want to fix this. Let me go to the, the product manager or program manager or whoever's kind of in charge of just, just, you know, defining the next piece of work to do and make the case with data yes. for why we sh uh, you should fix this thing. Um, and then we can show how we can evaluate the success of the fix and how the community users like this leading to that increased retention. Yes, we are the valuable ones that are not in the bubble, not in the echo chamber of what our product is because we're constantly out there yeah. dealing with people who either are rabid fans and now they're disappointed because something broke or became more expensive or whatever it is. And we can say, this is what people are saying and not just over lunch. They're actively messaging us and talking to us about it because it's a feedback is always a gift. It's someone else's time that they took instead of just not using your product anymore. They went to somebody they felt was approachable, which is usually us mm -hmm. <laughs> and saying, can you tell them to fix this thing? Because that is them saying, I'm enough of a fan to give you that feedback so that you will fix it. Or I'm interested enough in you fixing it that I would probably become your customer. Yes. Yeah, it's yeah. that love and hate are two sides of the same coin. It's mm -hmm. the people who are apathetic about your product. Yeah. They're, they're you know, you're not gonna get made to use for them. But the people who hate your product, the, the reason they're passionately hating it is because they love it enough to hate it. I mean, we first met through the Xamarin community, yes. for example. And that, I think, is a brilliant example of the amount of anger we would have as a community <laughs> when they inevitably broke something with yes. every single release. And the fact we were so annoyed about it, we're hating on the product, was because we loved what it was trying to achieve. Yes. And that brought us together as a very strong community because we had this common bond of, great, what are they broken in this release of Xamarin Corps? Or what's not, yeah, you know, we kind of expected, oh, Xamarin Studio's broken again. You know, and because we were so passionate about it, we were constantly giving that feedback to the Xamarin team and they were, to some degree, you know, fixing things, but that made the products better. Yes. Whereas if we didn't care about it, we'd be like, yeah, whatever, I'm, I'm gonna, go, gonna go to React Native. Yeah, apathy is, done. you should be allergic to apathy as a company. Like, if someone doesn't care, you either they're not your target market or you are not hitting the mark. Mm -hmm. They have to love it, they have to hate it, true. Now, it's interesting because as long as you still also have people who love it in addition to the haters, then you kind of know you're, you've hit a nerve. If everybody yeah. just hates it, like, this is a terrible idea, it sounds like a security nightmare, then maybe, maybe look into that a little yes. bit. Yeah. Uh, you should at least have some people that absolutely love what you're doing, and it should not be in your echo chamber. Yes. You cannot just self-congratulate, look at this amazing release we had, and not actually get feedback for that. It happens all the time. Yes. It happens all the time. Is that the product people oftentimes think they know, but they never ask. They don't ask around, and so they will rely on DevRel to tell them if people like it. Yeah. But if you don't align those KPIs the same, not, not even, no, you'll have different KPIs, but the same goal. If yeah. the goal is that developers should love your product, you need DevRel to find out if they do. Mm -hmm. And but also help developers understand it because it's possible that it's a little complicated of a product, but maybe you can help the ed educational side. So as long as your goal is the same, that you have less uh, issues with people quitting in the middle of what they were doing, less retention issues, then you know that you're both working towards that same goal of retention in different ways. Mm -hmm. If they don't have a formal feedback loop and you are the first ever hired, create one. We used to be under, we, meaning when I was at Okta, we used to be under marketing and it was great because we had all the money and we could go do all the trade shows and it was awesome. It was so much fun. But it was heartbreaking because the amount of top of funnel was our only KPI. And I we, we blew every KPI every month out of the water that was asked of us by marketing. But then we looked at how many people just either never logged in again or whatever, it was like 90%. And I'm like, why? Is it, and then at the end of the day, you might argue that's not DevRel's problem, that's the product's problem. And it's like, right, but we could help them figure that out. And then eventually we moved under product two years later when I was there. 
And it was different because we didn't have as much budget, but we were quite busy internally as well as externally because we were internally, to your point, advocating for the developer saying, do you, do you, are you getting feedback from somewhere? Are you just reading a report somewhere that says this is what developers like, or are you actively taking it? They said, we're using support. Like, right, but support are people who already have a relationship with you, already giving you money. They should have the one-on-one support that is tailored to their situation. But what about in general, this is a problem, which means they're not even going to bother paying you past the free tier. Yeah. What do we do there? And so that is when we formalize, okay, we could do it monthly, quarterly. We ended up doing it quarterly at first, and then it came, became monthly because they found so much value in the qualified feedback that we would give them. And then it grew to maybe we should do a white paper and go into people who don't even know about what we do to ask them, is something like this, would it be helpful to you? So we picked like a small, medium, and large size businesses in different verticals. Like we picked healthcare, we picked people who do more um, like internal B2B stuff. We, we picked different verticals to find out what is it like to be on a, a team, an engineering team like that. And Devrel got to help do that. And that was awesome. So technically it wasn't us at a trade show, but we had just as potent of conversations because we got to go literally to that company and say, give us 20 minutes either on a Zoom call or in person and say, it isn't about our product. It's saying, what are these problems that you have? And we got to take that and create our own white paper. So if you don't have the data you need, go and get it. Oftentimes they would say yes to coming in. Yeah, they want to speak to someone who can, who wants, who would listen to them, yes. empathize yeah. with them. That developer empathy is so, so important and then help them get a solution to their problem whether it's through your products or not. Right. And again, this is something you can measure. You can say, we are having X number of conversations. And then of these X number of conversations, we have raised these number of product issues. And then since we've had these product issues fixed, we are showing that 90% don't get past the free tier. Right. That's now dropped. There's now 80% don't get past the free tier, which means, oh, suddenly you've got 10% more, yes. more, more customers, or 100% more customers, depending on how you measure it. Um, so yeah, you, again, it's that, that showing the effectiveness it's very time intensive work that you have to do but mm -hmm. you can show that effectiveness through this number of conversations led to this number of issues led to this number of product changes and here's the metric the bar being moved and the only way this works in terms of the company understanding your value is several is if everybody listens if you're the only org or part of the org that is listening to your customers potential customers that's a problem yes. and that's not something that you can overcome that means that you have to, everybody's goals have to be set up to listen to feedback regardless of where it comes from. Mm -hmm. And there should be a formal cycle for that so that you can tie it back to each other and you're like, oh, I'm so glad that support did this. And I'm so glad that marketing actually targeted and went out there and did this thing because you can have the same goals, different KPIs to get to that goal. Yes. Now you're telling me, I can't remember who it was, but you told me the other day about an article or a, or a video or something about somebody talking about goals about how they, at the moment we've been talking about how goals tie into DevRel, but how do they tie into the business at large? Because one of the big issues, as we talked about at, at the start of this, was DevRel teams need to validate their effectiveness to an organization. Because we've seen companies get rid of DevRel teams like that because they're like, we don't understand what, we, what you do, we don't see your value. So you have to feed that back not just into value you bring to marketing if you're in marketing, the product if you're in product, but the business as a whole. And the article you were talking about referenced essentially tying every single KPI or metric that you have into a top level business objective. Yeah. Because if you can do that, then to a certain extent, of course the numbers actually matter, but you can have great numbers and the CEO looks at it and goes, but that doesn't feed into what I'm trying to do. Or you can have average numbers, but every single one of them hits home in some way. They're like, you're helping us move the needle. Thank you very much. Yes. Yeah. I mean, we, for example, we we are a new company, we think about users. Right now, it's products free, so it's users. How many users have we got? And that's the number one thing on the CEO's mind, is right. how many people are signing up. Yeah. So if we can show that through DevRel, mm -hmm. these are the number of people we've had, the number of touch points that we've made with the people we've conversed with. Mm -hmm. um, this has led to this much product feedback, which has reduced the number of drop-off, and, you know, and it's showing that we are slowly getting the number up. Right. Through the activities we're doing, the, the number of users is increasing. We are hitting that one metric the CEO cares about. If we weren't totally. hitting that metric, the CEO right. like, why am I, why am I paying? If you went all in on support, yeah, you wouldn't be as effective in his eyes or her eyes, yeah, as you are at the moment, mm -hmm. because you would still be doing a great job, and everybody who uses you 
would love it. Yeah. And you probably would still get some increases in, in usage because they would prefer on your behalf. Mm -hmm. But you wouldn't be focusing on the right thing. Yeah. So exactly. Even though it's very effective. Yes. Right. Making sure you align with uh, the company objectives. I guess perhaps your point, Heather, about it should report to the CTO in some ways mm. so that you are thinking about the company metrics as a whole. What are the C suite thinking? rather than what is the product team thinking or what's the marketing team thinking. Like you said, when you're on a marketing team, the marketing objectives were top of funnel, how many people do we reach? Or campaign based, yeah, which are very short bursts. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they'll just come a certain seasons. Endeavor is a year round endeavor, yes. right? And they're like, oh, we only care during trade show season. I'm like, no, 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 no. It, this is an ongoing relationship and people feel like they know you. Yeah. People that you've never met feel like they know you and your endeavor because you spend so much time educating them. Yeah. You know, so it's, then you kind of need to have just, just enough money to do those things, which is like the keep the lights on thing. We need to have enough to where money to where we actually have videos going out. We actually have this, you know, right now, right now, the argument would be, how do you know that everything that you're focused on is not one of those short term campaigns? And then you're going to have to pivot your entire strategy in six months. And it, if you, but if you ask the C-suite, what they want to do doesn't change that often. It happens. 12 to 18, maybe 24 months is mm -hmm. really, they tend to stick to, this is what I want to do for the year or for the next two to five years. They're like, yeah. this is what it looks like to grow. Spend a lot of time with them. Most C-suites are happy to talk to you, regardless of the size of company, if you at least are at the top in your group. Yeah. So if you're the lead of DevRel, they're happy to talk to you because you cost money. And they would love to know <laughs> mm -hmm. how you can help them with this goal. Yes. But remember, all of their managers under them and their VPs under them will have their own goals. And don't get too distracted by just that. Make sure that you always tie it back to what the very top wants to do. Yes. And if you don't, you should be asking yourself, why is your VP doing something so different that is not going to in any way tie back in? Which sounds a little bit uh, intensive in terms of uh, just thought. But every time somebody has started doing that, they're like, they had to ask, what is the identity of the company? What is the, the reputation of the company? What do you do here? Yeah. Yes, this is a cool new product that is kind of a one-off. It feels like a one-off, and that's all you're going to evangelize for. But really, what does your company overall do? Yeah. What are they trying to accomplish? Mm -hmm. As long as you understand that and can tie things back, you'll, you will get so much more trust over time as to what you're doing. Freedom comes um, by qualification. Yeah. Like. They're not going to trust you until you've demonstrated that you get to that top level goal. Yeah. If you don't get it, then they'll, they feel like they're going to have to constantly herd you. And you're going to feel like, well, I, I gave them my, my KPIs were for that time and I'm, I'm hitting them. So why do I still feel micromanaged? Why do I still feel like this and that? And sometimes that will happen because you just haven't demonstrated that you get the overall goal of the company. Yeah. So kind of as for folks who are thinking about kind of head of DevRel positions yeah. and that kind of thing is the number one thing to do is make sure you've got that alignment and that every activity you're doing has got that not just to say that not that season alignment of it's trade show season we do trade shows it's that how does this come through to the bigger picture of what it is that the top level is looking um, to get yeah. so how do I measure what I'm doing that aligns into that so I can actually feed those numbers in yes. and then how do I make sure that's the needle I'm moving. It's very easy to get um, content-itis with this. You think, oh, as long as I'm churning something out once a week, twice a week, it doesn't matter what the quality is. Yeah. It just, because look at how many eyeballs, that's all that matters. But that's not what matters. Especially in that developer journey, you're not, you, you, in a way, you're kind of betraying your own people because mm -hmm. you're just saying, well, oh, the only thing that matters to my company is the numbers. And I'm like, would you talk to them about where the developer is on their journey and what you are solving on that journey? If the answer is we just need awareness, to put on your hat and give a, a lot of stickers. That's fine. Mm -hmm. That means you are the first touch point where you're probably not going to talk to them for another year. Yeah, and you and need that four or five touch points to get them through the journey. So, so just the, that one. The touch points are necessary. Yeah. You, and it, it sucks, but people aren't just going to shake your hand the first time they meet you. Mm -hmm. And so that means that you have to say, okay, how much money are we going to spend on touch points? It, uh, eventually, it was just actually its own bucket saying, we do need awareness where we can't even collect their data. So how much are we going to spend on that? Yeah. And then based on the state of developer relations report, we looked at how many touch points does it take, you know, per person. And then we kind of looked at how many people converted. And then we reverse engineered that saying, okay, they probably had four touch points. Mm -hmm. So how much do we spend to get them to this? And that's how you can tie how much money you're willing to spend on those touch points up to there. Yeah, which is that kind of return on investment idea because everyone has that question. I'm spending a million dollars on, on um, DevRel 
how can I prove it's worth it? Well, this is how many conversions we got, and based off the touch points we had to get them there, this is, this is the value. And so the question is, how do you know how many touch points it took? And most people will tell you. Yeah. They're saying, oh, I saw you here, and then it's always, it's not ever just once. Oh, I saw you here. I saw you there. This person AWS talked about you. Then a friend of mine worked on this project. It's always like that. Mm -hmm. And it's always like the story of how you really came to be, to decide that you use our product. And the thing is, is that you don't got them once they've signed up. You can lose them right away. Remember that 90% drop off that I talked yep. about? And DevRel's job is not done once they've hit sign up. No. I feel like it becomes more interesting at that point. And that's kind of develop a journey where we hit the build and scale. Kind of this sign up, kind of the learn point. That's only halfway through that journey that we're responsible for is that build and scale. Mm. That's where we help them to use more, where it's very much the documentation, the, the content we create, rather than the, the more social touch points. Yeah. It's that more, that content that we can provide them that shows them the real value of using the product, building out these different features of the product and kind of using it more. That's where it comes into play. Yes. it's. I think, again, it's the most interesting. I long time ago, I had a blog post that said, I'm declaring war on Hello World because it actually isn't helpful when you're trying to really use a product. Mm -hmm. It's cool to see, to get what it is. Hello World is like, I get what it is. Yeah. But when is it useful enough for me to pay for it mm -hmm. and continue to pay for it? Those are different questions. And DevRel can run out of content ideas when you only have so many ways that you can integrate with React, integrate with Angular, integrate, done that. And like, right, so now you've done that. Now what? Yes. The, it's the 201 talks, not just the 101, where it becomes interesting, and yet there are less of them. There are less people that are ready for the 201 talks. Mm -hmm. So that means it needs to still be there. You cannot measure your 201 talks with number of eyeballs. That is no. not appropriate no. for it. That is measured with retention. Mm -hmm. That's your retention content, which means it has to be how many people clicked on this link to, to, to be educated on it, then that continued in their process and not, oh, well, I'm still just never going to log in again because that wasn't helpful. Then you kind of know that your content isn't helping. Yeah. And then I have other questions about, well, isn't that really Doc's job? What is it? We, we cross over so many different things and you probably have to be more of their North Star saying, this probably isn't that helpful. Maybe we should have some content and I'm happy to create the first pieces of it, but maybe for the long longevity of what the the product is docs should be renovated in a certain manner mm -hmm. you can help broker that relationship because usually docs are owned sometimes by devrel but oftentimes by engineering and so sometimes it's overly complex or overly um, broken apart so people don't actually know how to connect each pieces or how to select the correct one you can be the decision tree you can say here's the decision tree of why you would use this doc or why would you use that approach that's appropriate for devrel to do yeah. And it's difficult because you aren't the fan of the product. You're the fan of the education. You see? Mm -hmm. That really is what separates you from the docs team. Yeah, but I, I feel docs should always be part of developer relations because it is. Your relationship with developers revolves around their ability to use your product. So docs is part of that developer relations. Um, and engineers, sorry <laughs> to say this, but in general, engineers are not the best at writing documentation. To other engineers. Yeah, you thought we're, we're engineers, we, we have this common language, but we cannot write good docs that tell you how to do it. Because we right. want to geek out on the things rather than actually think, what is the problem we're trying to solve? Oh, yeah. the other problem with that as well is that the engineers who wrote the code have all of these, they, they have a whole of assumptions and existing knowledge, mm -hmm. which are, yeah, plays into the assumptions of the context, they have that relevant context. So they'll write documentation and they'll miss out key components thinking, well, that's obvious, isn't it? But if somebody's never seen your product before, they're like, I missed that piece. Why wasn't it in the documentation? Mm -hmm. So it, it's actually better for somebody who didn't write it. But even then, you could say, well, maybe one engineer should write the documentation for something that another engineer wrote. But I, I'm an engineer as well. I don't like documentation. I also work in DevRel, so I have to do the documentation. Yeah. Um, and, and it is an interesting twist and, and a different headspace to be in. So yeah. definitely guess worthwhile with having a different team for that. I guess with documentation as well, just thinking back to metrics, that's what we're going to talk about. The, the success with documentation is how many people read multiple pages in documentation. They go to Hello World, yay, cool. But do they go to that 200 level content, the, right. the how to guides to solve a particular problem, the tutorials that look for a particular scenario? You know, how many people complete 
a multi-step tutorial, at least get 60% of the way right. through. Mm -hmm. How many people are reading your how-to guides? That comes back to that retention measurement of the way people stick around is by reading your docs. So if you've got this massive drop-off that 90% of the people who sign up just never come back again, and you're, all you're seeing is the Hello World docs being looked at, and maybe someone goes, a few people look at the 200 level docs, then drop straight out again. Right. Then that's a very big indicator that your problem is documentation. So again, it's like, let's work on this. Let's fix our documentation and then see whether that measurement moves. Does our retention measure increase? Are we seeing more consumption of 200 level content? Um, again, it doesn't need to be a hard number. We must get a hundred thousand views on it. It's just, are we seeing that trend upwards? Are we seeing the number of 200 level content users going up and the retention also going up? If so, we can say there is probably a correlation. You may not better prove the causation unless you get around to tracking actual users on your website right. um, yeah, by the individual user ID, but really you can show that causation, uh, so that, that correlation, which again justifies your numbers. It's a, it's a wonderful space because you actually get to have a, a much more holistic view of the problems in your company than probably in other departments do. Because <laughs> you're like, ah, oh, we, we are great in this, maybe not so much in that, and actually in a way that is really valuable to your C-suite. So if you have the ability to to reach out and, and create a relationship with your CG, you should. Mm -hmm. Because they may have no visibility in an overall way as to how the departments are working together and to solve certain kinds of problems. And the one that sticks out to me is, does everybody know, right down to your accountants, what your products do? Do they, and at least at a technical level across marketing, sales, and engineering, do they understand the use cases? Because I can't write a cool guide for you if I only understand the one use case that the C-suites have managed to communicate. When maybe if you're really creative and you're like, oh, this could be used in that manner and this manner, that's great. That's great for sales, that's great for marketing, that's great for engineering, because then they're like, oh, well then we should support these use cases. Mm -hmm. But oftentimes docs are not broken down by use case, they're just broken down by what they're called. And that's not helpful because I don't know if explore the docs is, is usually how people measure how good your docs are. Is that can you just go and kind of figure out the different scenarios you could do? The, uh, the example I'm going to give you is that oftentimes there's more than one way to implement authorization. Did you know that? There's OAuth, and then there's a whole bunch of other things that you probably, in many cases, should not do. Uh, but uh, <laughs> but how do you know which of the pieces of documentation you're reading correlates to what? You don't. Mm -hmm. So oftentimes the confusion to Devra will be, I did this and it didn't work. And I'm like, oh, but you're, you're going down this path. But there was no indication that it was a part of a different path. Yeah. It was just, this exists. That's great. But should you use it? Can you use it? What are the caveats based on that, that use case? Mm -hmm. Often not there. So sometimes Devrel can broker that gap and say, let's do some use case based guides. This is why you might use it for this. This is when you should not use it for that because you're just not going to have the right experience. Sales will not do that because they want them to use it for everything. Yeah. And that's disingenuous. So really you are kind of like the, the, the Jiminy Cricket on the shoulder saying, we should tell people when it's really good for them to do certain things and sometimes when it's not. Yeah. And so that they can be successful at avoidance or successful at implementation. And I guess just thinking back to the idea of we Devro should work so close with everyone, this also feeds back into marketing, the idea of their ideal customer persona. You know, to, oh, to do yes. good marketing, you need to set the personas. Yes. So if they're are saying, well, look, you're targeting this type of user, did you know it also applies to this type of user? Yes. Here is a guide for this. Now, when you think about your marketing materials, so like, for example, um, Pieces, it's like an AI coding assistant, um, and it does snippet management. And one of the things we can do is OCR. So you've got a, a picture with some code on it, you drop it in, we pull out the code, we augment it which is great if you're a student, because you will be in a lecture and someone will put a slide up with code on there. So it's like, take a photograph of that, drag yep. piece. So suddenly we've got this idea of there is a student persona that yes. we can target. So how do we build the relevant user guides for that? And then also, because it's students as a persona, in terms of like marketing to students, where should we be? Well, we should be at universities. We yes. should be at some computer science societies. How do we kind of use that idea of we've defined this persona to change the marketing activities we do not maybe not change, but add on to the marketing things we do to go to this different persona, and suddenly we've opened up another large audience. So, and then we can test that out. We can try it, put it in front of students, and if it doesn't resonate, 
okay, fine, let's, we tried that persona, let's not bother that persona anymore. But if it resonates, right, that's another persona we've got. And again, right. we could think that feeds into our overall metric of how many people use the product, um, but, but it's just, we're targeting students. So Absolutely. just having that idea of personas really helps, supports the marketing KPIs, supports the product KPIs. And even the sales at the end. And sales, because sales can go, okay, we're supporting students now. Students don't have lots of money. So how do we do this? Yeah, how do you build like a student plan into it? So as you, how can we maybe do a university level plan or something mm. like that? We kind of think about how we sell differently because it's a different type of audience. Yeah. So. The developer persona is an excellent example of a multi-department shared goal. Yes. But the KPIs are specific to how DevRel does it, how the sales do it. They're actually, the KPIs are different for mm. what you're going to do to execute, but you have a shared goal, which means you're going to want to support each other to get to the same thing. Yes. But if you don't have those conversations with each other, DevRel is actually the perfect um, peacemaker for it. They're like, hey, you kind of want to do stuff and we kind of want to do stuff. Let's all get in a room and figure out, do we have a goal we all kind of want to hit? And we'll just do it in our own ways, our own KPIs. And that way, you're not going to feel like, ah, oh, I did my job, but marketing didn't do their job. Engineering didn't do their job. Then you have the infighting that starts happening and everybody blames DevRel. <laughs> <laughs> like, DevRel didn't do their job. I'm like, what is DevRel's job? To broker relationships internally and externally on behalf of developers. Yeah. That is their relations is in our title so that means don't be afraid to be the first one to say we don't have a shared goal can we create one mm -hmm. and maybe that is a developer persona it also could be everybody does awareness when you are five people in a startup can you do it in your own way with your own kpis to get to that yeah and so that's okay but if you just say oh i don't care about that i just don't want as many support tickets if you're in the avoidance goal then you actually don't care what the rest of us do you're just trying to not get support tickets and it feels very much like you're on an island away mm -hmm. and devil can feel like that too like you're out there trying to fight the good fight and nobody really understands what it is you do but that probably ironically is because you did not communicate well about how we can all get to the same metrics so when we think about help first sell last not just helping our our developers our end users but also helping sure. internally Internal. how do i help internally how do i help you as a marketing team how do i help you as a sales team which again comes back to your point about if you devrel is a separate org in, in its entirety you don't feel like you're being pulled one way. It's not like, oh no, but you're part of the marketing, so you only right. care about our, right. our metrics. It's like, well, I want to work with these people and help their metrics because that helps your metrics. And it's trying to get that understanding can be hard if you're tied into one particular team. And well, that, go ahead. I remember having a conversation at a, a previous job with one of the sales people. And he had come from a space that was very much account management led. Like you always spoke to a C-level executive at your target customer. Uh, there was only one way in to sell all of these kind of things and he was really confused about going back to the ret retention part as well once DevRel has a, a developer in any kind of a funnel like the developers use the product likes the product why do we care about the developer retention because we want to convert into sale and then we want the company retention so having those personas was a really easy way to help describe that developers and companies aren't the same thing because thinking about the touch points as well, it takes five or six or seven or whatever touch points. That can often take 18 months. How often do developers change jobs nowadays? Mm -hmm. So the developer we're talking to today might work for company A, but the sale might be with company B by the time they actually get to that touch point of, oh, I remember this product and it's going to help on this, this thing that All we're working on here. So remembering that a developer is not equal to a sale is, is very important as well. Especially because we're having this idea now, and that's kind of what's pushing a lot of DevRel, that developers are in this position of influence in their company. I mean, Twilio right. did that. They're big billboards. Ask your developer. Yeah. The idea that developers will say, I want to use these tools, mm -hmm. and they will influence up the chain to get someone to pay for those tools. And that will even impact the jobs they go to. They want to go to a job, hey, I love this tool. I want to use it. They go, yeah, no. Yeah, I mean, I'm a bit like that. I'm, I'm a Mac user, for example. I, so if you made me use Windows, that would actually discourage me from taking the job because right. I feel comfortable in this environment I know it it works for me and so if you make me change my environment I'm not going to change, um, yeah. change jobs so same thing we have this power um, especially when we're in the, the kind of market where there's less developers than jobs maybe yeah. we're not there at the moment but when we swing back to that again developers have that power to set the tools I will only take this job you want me but these are my requirements of the tools that I have so we have this ability to influence mm -hmm. and so as you say if, if a developer likes you the sale may be in their current company, 
And then when they go to a new company, that's another sale. The right. sale won't be in their current company because how long it takes, it's in their, their next company. Um, or they tell their friends about it, it's in their next company. So yeah, yeah it's very important we have that, that strong relationship with developers to build those touch points. Yeah, and maintaining it afterwards. And maintain it continuously, yeah. yes. Um, now going back to touch points, I do want to talk a little bit about conferences. Obviously we're at KCDC. Yes. Um, yeah, Heather, you're one of the organizers here. Um, conferences are relatively expensive. For, for companies, and if DevRel is part of marketing, we have money. Um, if we're not, it's, tr- it's a problem. But how do we measure that return on investment of a conference? You know, when we're thinking, should I come and sponsor KCDC mm. next year? Obviously, you're going to say yes, but if you can take your <laughs> organizer hat off for a second and put your DevRel hat on. Should I ask him? Um, <laughs> yeah. well, how do we, as DevRels, quantify the impact we have and the return on investment? Because I think this touches on a number of different things. It's that awareness, but it's also those conversations we have. So I guess for both of you, different thoughts from both sides of the, the conference. How do we quantify ROI for attending an event? Depends on how you turn up. Okay. A lot of people will turn up and I've walked around here and there are some booths that have some pamphlets and some stickers and they sit there and they talk to people and that's kind of all the lowest minimum bar to entry. Mm-hmm. But we've got some people here with... Uh, Jenga towers, we've got arcade games, we've got people who've, who've really thought about how they want to engage with the community. And the more thought you put into it beforehand, and the better you execute while you're there, the better quality metrics you can actually get, because yeah. you'll have actual interactions. Mm-hmm. Uh, you're not just, you and I were talking about the Lego set over there before. Yeah. Like, neither of us were particularly interested in the product, but we wanted to give our details away for the Lego. So they na- they've now got a lead, but what value is that to them? Mm-hmm. So you have to work out like what, how would you maximize your value in the first place yeah. before you even start measuring it? Yeah, so how do you, it's not just about how many badges can I scan. Right. Yeah, for that, you can send someone out and say, yeah, oh, do you want a t-shirt? Have a t-shirt, I'll scan your badge. Have a t-shirt, I'll scan your badge. And what you've got is a whole list of people who wanted a t-shirt. Yes. Um, you know, I, mean, I love Lego. Don't get me wrong. I'm gonna every, every Lego set I see, I'm giving my details over. I don't care about the company. Yep. I'm never gonna use whatever that company is. We were talking about it earlier. I, yep. I, I knew the Lego set. Mm-hmm. I didn't know the company because yep. that, that I was just interested in the thing. Sure. So yeah, it's if you can rather than do that, it's when people come to your booth, you need to have those conversations. I think you need to have deeper conversations, and then you show up with people who can have those conversations. That's it. The best execution I've seen is people who have a booth and have a plan. Mm -hmm. So you have a plan. You've already thought about this is what we talk about. And if they are interested in more than like talking for 30 seconds, we have the deep divers. So you're going to have one or two per shift that are going to be the deep divers that are going to take them to the other side of the booth and be like, pull out a laptop. Let's talk about this. But then you have people who are just much more passive about it. You'll also have to pay attention to repeats people will come back to your booth mm-hmm. notice them it's hard at larger shows but at developer events it's easier because we're usually not we're not as big as like south by southwest or something yeah. like that um we have 1600 people here for this one so that's enough mm-hmm. uh, that also means you probably shouldn't get random people who know nothing about your products sitting standing at your booth but they as long as they've been through some sort of training and has some sort of plan it's like good enough it's like yeah. saying hey we just need the initial touch point but remember, the second touch point could be at the same event later that day or the next day. Yeah. I find that there are less people um, than the first day of the conference that you'll see coming around the booth because everybody usually gets a stamp or gets your swag. But the people on the second day are much higher qualified because now they've heard of you and they came back. Yes. So don't just be sitting there bored being like, uh, we're just not that busy with a bunch of people to give away. Just saying, hey, did you come by yesterday? And like, do you have questions? Um, and the touch point might be right now it's a t-shirt. It took Telerik four years to get me to finally actually play with their product, but I did. And I'm like, oh, well, if I need a UI product, now I will use that. Yeah. Because also they were not pushing. So have a booth, have a plan. Mm-hmm. And then you can have, and your ROI is so influenceable by your plan. Like one booth over there is just like, no, nah, we didn't really get anything, but they also didn't have a plan. Mm. We have another booth that's like, okay, this person's on this shift, and what if you're the only one that gets to go and you have to be there all day? Make sure that you can have some of this parts automated for you, that if you have people have questions, maybe it's a QR code they scan, maybe it's a, um, that takes them directly to a Calendly, so that you can talk to me tomorrow for 15 minutes and just just schedule it. Have a plan. Mm-hmm. Um, and those plans seem based around the idea of 
having different types of conversations. Yes. So the plan is um, you have that very quick story. Yep. You know, what does your company do? What does ArcJet do? What does mm. Pieces do? You need that 30 second, that, that line you repeat in your sleep that says, this is what we do. Mm -hmm. And then if that sparks the interest, you then have those very well-defined demos. It's yes. like, let me show you this thing. Yeah, you have those conversations, you ask a few questions to work out which use case to show, yep. and then you pick one of a number of set of standard demos that you've planned, rehearsed, take to every conference, and it's like bang, 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 bang. Right. And then that becomes a good touch point, and then it can be right, how, um, that, leave it at that, maybe scan a QR code, yes. set them up ready for the next, the next touch point. And I think what's really important here is to then write this down. Yes. Just think about metrics, because I think we are talking about this earlier. Do a retro. Yeah, but yeah. just, you know, if I talk to somebody, I want to flag that's a DevRel qualified lead. I yes. want to know that you know, it's tracked people I talk to. But also, if this conversation had some kind of product feedback, they say, yes, okay, this is great, but I don't like this, or I need this, we can raise those issues, like you are saying earlier, we can track the product feedback through the number of issues that are raised. And so we've got that, that metric measurement of the product feedback from the event. When it comes to deciding whether or not to do conferences at all, uh, it's kind of 50-50. When I had interviewed at other places, they're like, we don't have money for conferences, but maybe we'll send you to a meetup. That also, to me, conferences are just really large meetups. Like, yes. It's the same thing. Be prepared, have a plan. Mm -hmm. Don't just say, hi, it's us, we paid for the pizza. Like, have a good plan. Have a good plan for what yep. to do, even if there's only 10 people there so that they can actually talk to you and do this. And oftentimes they're quite grateful, so they will talk to you because yeah. you helped their meetup continue. Mm -hmm. But then also have a plan how to choose where to go. Sometimes, if you're in, let's say, security industry, it may be very expensive to go to certain conferences, but you need to be seen mm -hmm. as a brand at that big security conference. And if you're not, people are not going to give you the big contracts because you weren't at that event. Mm -hmm. And that absolutely is real. They judge you based on, are you willing to invest in the community? Or not? Yeah. Are you willing to invest in people to talk to us in the community? Or not? Is, is really big. Not that you can't scale to some degree just doing online stuff, but I find that at some point when people are going to spend real money with you, they want to talk to real people. Yes. You've just reminded me talking about community. Uh, we were talking about this just before as well. There are some really bad ways of doing engagement. Yes. Mm -hmm. And there was an event I was at a couple of years ago. And I'm going to use the word unfortunately. Unfortunately, it was one of those stereotypical ones where DevRel uh, was supporting a marketing initiative. And they sent a marketing team to uh, a developer conference, very grassroots development conference. And in fact, they, the, the marketing team organized it, but then they sent salespeople to be on the booth. Now, there's a term in sales called a SPIF, which is a sales performance in, uh, incentive fund, I think. And you see this in like brick and mortar stores where you've got a, the, the last year's model of something that they're just trying to clear off the floor and they say, if you sell these, we'll double your commission on those sales. It's a yeah. way of getting stuff out of the door quickly. Yeah. So they applied that to the way they were organizing the engagement at this, this conference. Um, and I heard the, one of the sales managers turn to the whole team, including me, saying, if you can get three signups to our mailing list, you can go home for the rest of the day. And I thought, where is the focus on the community here? Or We're the here education. for the community or the education. Yeah. Um, it wasn't even about what do we do. And I tell you what, they, they said that to me and I said, I'm out. This is not what DevRel does. Mm -hmm. uh, I highly recommend you don't do this. But I'm out. But then immediately three of the salespeople saw somebody coming out of a talk while the talk was still going on. So they obviously left for a reason. Yeah. I don't think it was because the talk was bad. They had a call to make or they had somewhere to be. They literally stampeded over there in order to try and get them to sign up. So always, have a plan, have a good plan, but always consider the fact that the reason you're there is for engagement with the community. Yes. That is the, the underlying foundation of why you should be at any event ever. Mm -hmm. You're there to support them, to hear from them, to care about them. Yeah, and DevRel is, again, help first, sell last. Developers don't like salespeople. If yeah. someone's trying to convince us to sign up, push us, push us, push us, we're like, yeah, I'm out. Yeah. And so, Sales has a very important role in the company. We all want to sell something. You know, all of us contribute to sales in some way because that's how we get paid. But the mechanics of sales is very different to the mechanics of developer relations. And developers don't like being sold to. We want to engage with other developers. We want to chat to engineers. So if you put sales out in front of us, 
We can smell them a mile. Right. If, we, we if there's a booth back. and there's someone in a suit, <laughs> or someone who looks um, like they're very it's... uncomfortable in, in a hoodie, they, it's just that they've put the very expensive shoes with the hoodie. There's a yeah. guy here in a green Joker suit. That's that's okay. Oh, yeah. That works. Yeah. 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 The, uh, no, it's a Riddler suit. Oh, it's a Riddler. Um, yeah, it's related to the talk he was giving yesterday. Oh, okay. But yeah, that works. <laughs> but if you're there in that the sharp suit, or you're mm. trying to dress down by putting jeans with your suit jacket, right? Yeah, we will smell you a mile off, and we will avoid you. Yeah. yeah, but you're there with, you know, with with a hoodie on or whatever, looking like an utter geek. Then everyone's like, "Yes, I want to chat to you." So we want to have those authentic conversations. Kind of authenticity is, is important. So part of that plan is being authentic. Yes, and if you do your education right, and it makes sense, the developers will ask you for that relationship. Can I can you talk, can I talk to an account manager now? Right. Mm-hmm. Can I do that? They will ask you. You shouldn't have to like here. And let how me hand you. How powerful is that when they're specifically asking to speak somebody? Because you've created the trust, right? Mm-hmm. And you have demonstrated listening, which is usually where we're most powerful. Is that we've demonstrated we've listened. Yes. And we've also pointed out which path is not the right one for them and which is the right one for them. Mm-hmm. Which means they go, "Got it. Now I have a plan. Let me talk to you, to the people who can make this happen." Yes. Yeah, and that have- is the happy path. That's the one we want. We want that to be. If your product's good. Already, we know that it's good because you work there. Hopefully, you chose well. Uh, <laughs> they're like, I know our product's good. They just don't know about it. But then, now they trust that they'll also get the right kind of treatment. You are the first indication of how they'll be treated by your company. So they come to you. They say, yeah. Oh, you look like you align with the problem I've got. Let me tell you my problem. Okay, right. from your problem, here's how I think we can solve your problem for you. Because really, developers. They, they want to solve their problems and go home. That's how I think about it. Every yes. day, they come in, they've got problems <laughs> to solve, get those solved and go home. So if we can show, yes, you have this problem, this is how we can help you with this problem, then they're happy, that they'll think about it, that's the first touch point, maybe they'll come back later on or the next day, ask another question, second touch point, maybe they'll come back or they'll send someone else over, mm-hmm. again, ask another question, and then it's, okay, I think I want to go forward with this, can you make that connection with the right person to do this? And that's like, yes, yeah. perfect. And then we track that, we write that down, we scan the badge, yes. we note that down, we can say we had this conversation, we have these number of touch points with this person, and then put this in, this, in our CRM, so a qualified lead, so later on, when that million dollar sale happens, we can say, we spent $20,000 at this conference, and it led to this million dollar lead. There'll always be a lag, away. there'll always be a lag on it. Oh yes, especially with large enterprises. Yes. Sales understands lag, mm-hmm. But sometimes uh, they're often kind of much later in the process, right? Yeah. So our lag will be greater than even a normal sales cycle lag. So as long as uh, time is, is kind of baked in there, uh, the, the question everybody has is, you know, we want to uh, hire slow, fire fast. How do we know the DevRel's effective? When is DevRel not effective? Uh, is there a metric that points to DevRel not being effective? So doing the other way, mm. right? I mean... That's, I guess it's the lack of metrics shows that DevRel is not effective. It's really, yeah, it's really hard to. The only way I could really see through a metric to show DevRel is not effective is complaints about DevRel people. That's literally the only one. I met this DevRel person and they were an utter ass. That obviously. That's a pretty good indicator. It's usually Something's good indicator. wrong. Yeah, but it's it's. But I if a company is investing in you, you say mm. let's say you cost a couple hundred thousand. Yeah. You know plus. You should have some money, some budget for some kind of swag, even if it's just stickers. And being able to either go to something or money for video production, or whatever. Yeah. So you already cost at least half a million dollars, even if it's just one or two people, okay? Yeah. At least. So they're like, where's my half a million dollars going? And how do I know before I invest for two, three years because of the lag? How do I know it's working along the way? How do I know if I had a great DevRel hire or a bad one? And it's not that DevRel's not valuable, but maybe they weren't the right one to lead it, or they weren't the right one to implement it. Yeah. And uh, I'm sure you've probably seen people who were not effective mm-hmm. in their role. So maybe we're asking, is there ways that other people who are considering having developer relations, is something they can look out for, so at least they can sort of protect their budget along the way to maybe replace that person that we might be better suited. Because it's hard, because we're asking yeah. for lagging, right? Mm-hmm. And that's trust. So we're yeah. asking, invest millions in us before you even really see any true ROI tied. So this is where a, uh, even partially fully fledged strategy helps. Mm-hmm. You know what your goals are. You've tied them into the business goals, not yes. just your departmental goals. Mm-hmm. You've tied them into the goals you have for the community. And then you define, okay, here's what we think a lag is going to look like. 
So in order to reach these things, here are the actual KPIs on those goals. And then we tie those, and because those KPIs are also tied into the business goals, we tie that into performance, and we can measure whether or not DevRel is actually hitting them up in the same way as you would just with a software engineer. So now you're asking some... Things, sorry. Go ahead. No. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, 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 sorry. We just interrupt because we get excited. Yeah. And, so, <laughs> and so really then, you're uh, someone who does DevRel well, you're asking them to not only be an engineer who's coded mm-hmm. and be a, a enough of a people person, uh, even if uh, to at least be able to engage and present, you're also asking them to understand business jargon mm-hmm. and how to take the, the non-specific goals that aren't really written down but to get a good feel. Well, that, you, that depends yeah. on the size of the DevRel team. Yeah. Well, so well like we're just talking with small. Yeah, but yeah, if yeah. I'm the only one at Object, yes, I have to understand everything. But at Vault Zero, I didn't have to understand everything mm-hmm. because there was a person who was head of. They did the strategy. They tied things into business. They were talking to the VPs. And they would then translate that right. into a language that the DevRels can understand. Here's your target. Yes. It's not actually labeled the same way, but the target is something that I as a DevRel can understand. Yeah. And so we're talking about leveling up, right? You, you, there's the developer relations engineer who's just concerned with the out, with the outreach and what they're doing. Mm-hmm. And then there's somebody who's invested in much more in the management of those people. And then someone who's invested in strategy. But to people who are not in this, they're just like, DevRel just does this. And they don't understand that there are levels of people in DevRel mm-hmm. more than just some experience, sure. But we're talking about responsibility levels here about how much you're actually invested in what the company does and that you can suss that out and understand and have those conversations, have a seat at the table, mm-hmm. right? That's yeah. different than just go out and do your DevRel thing. That's a different level of a person that, which is what I was when I started. Then I just became more interested in the strategy because I, I was so disappointed that all my effort wasn't being appreciated because, and I didn't realize I probably should have monitored things differently and shown the metrics. It's so tempting to just go, look at how many videos I made. I yeah. could make terrible videos and still hit those metrics. Yeah. If your metric is you will need to make um, two videos a week for a year, cool. I can do that. Yep. They won't be rubbish. I'll do them all next week and I'll take the rest of the year off. Right? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I'll use some AI tools and also generate them. Done. Um, but it's, yeah, it's really, it's, it's not about that. It's about I, how my video has been effective. And okay. in a large organization, I guess going back to the comparison between large and small, in a large organization, you can have people when you say, just create two videos a week, every week. And then someone else is looking at those metrics and they can come back and say, okay, in the last two months, you did these videos on these topics. This is what worked. This is what didn't. So please focus more on things that work. So you kind of get that hand holding all the way through. I love the experiment cycle. Like, let's do this for a quarter. Let's do this for six months. Yeah. And then, is it working? Yes. We have to decide if it's working and then communicate that you did that retrospective to other mm-hmm. departments. Yes, it's kind of. It doesn't matter if it's not working, as long as you prove that and learn from it. So and tell say, them. Yes. Hey, we spent a month doing this, and look how terrible we did. So we're not <laughs> going to do it again. Um, we had this actually an inverse situation at Microsoft. They did something, and because everyone was worried, as Microsoft did big, big layoffs, everyone was worried about looking bad. The experiment went very, very badly. Yeah. Except they boasted about how it was a great thing. Because look, these numbers are amazing, and the numbers were actually terrible. It's all about um, YouTube Shorts. So, yeah, yeah. you know, YouTube Shorts, high numbers of views because everyone's viewed a few seconds. And the number of views on a lot of videos was terrible. But it seemed like a big number for a whole stack of videos. So, yeah, I did an Instagram Reel once and got four times that number on one Reel. And I've only got 300 followers most of the spam bots. You know, um, and this is like a big YouTube channel with tens yeah. of thousands of followers. And, and so they had to make it look like a good thing because they were worried about the large organizational politics of saying this experiment failed, which is mm. a terrible way to do it. We yeah. should be able to say, we tried this, it, it didn't work. work yeah. And so we're not going to do it. It's if we try it, it doesn't work. And you commit. And we commit to doing it more. <laughs> yes. That's a problem. You know, whether it's conferences, whether it's videos, we need to define those good metrics. M- you measure them, use that to say, was this success or failure? And then from that, do we iterate or do we stop? And I think that's one thing a lot of people don't understand with DevRel is it is very experimental. Different communities, different companies, different people respond in different ways. You can't take, this is what I did at Microsoft or Okta and do the same at Pieces or Arctic. It doesn't work. You right. have to constantly experiment and iterate. Without the metrics, you can't, 
can't do that. And the metrics will look different depending mm-hmm. on the size of that company. Mm-hmm. So sometimes it's just, does anybody know we exist? Mm-hmm. I, a lot of large companies invested heavily in their product being great, and now they want to find net new customers that are in a different vertical. Or we cared only about BI people, and now we care about developers, suddenly. So now developers are new for the entire company to care about. They didn't used to. They used to care about like account managers. Now they have to care about a grassroots group of people. And, but they actually are a big company, but they're small in terms of their involvement with developers. Mm-hmm. Like they are, it's brand new. So regardless of the size of the overall company, sometimes it's just how long have they even dealt with it, with people who code. Yeah. You know, sometimes it can be quite small. And they're like, I don't know, we're gonna trust you uh, to figure it out. And that will go for like a year. And then they'll be like, what did we, did we get more people? Mm-hmm. Yes or no? They're, it's very baseline. It's not complicated. They're like, well, d- did this money go where I, I want to go? And we hate talking about money because we just want you to intrinsically feel that developer relations is valuable. Yeah. But that will cause many companies to go bankrupt if they do it wrong. Mm-hmm. Like, it's not going to work. Some companies lose a couple million, not a big deal. But startups, it will kill them. Oh, yeah. And so you have to be accountable to yourself. Uh, in, even if you're the only DevRel or if you're an organization of people under you, you should say, how can we help our internal company and them so that we can grow and not just have more of us, but we can feel like we've been valuable. Because oftentimes there's such a dislike of what the corporate structure is or a dislike of what everyone else is doing at the company that you want to be on a raft by yourself and just do your own destiny. But that actually doesn't help in the way you think it does. You think, oh, well, we're being great with our developers, but really you're not helping what they're trying to do. And so it's in a way disingenuous to not help your own company in, in what you're doing either. So you, we remember this is relationship and it goes both ways. It is us, our relationship with our developer community and our relationship with our internal community too. Yeah. So we should be able to be good at both. And that is my opinion. Now, if you're the only person that was a mishire, meaning like, your junior or mid-level uh, developer advocate, you've never done strategy, but this company only had enough money for one person, so who has a strategy? Usually marketing, because they're the ones who come up with it, and you're literally not paid enough, nor do you have the experience to know what that strategy is. That's the mishire. That's the expectation that you're just gonna make magic happen, but you, you're you just following whatever you, they told you to do. And they actually don't want you to be a marketing person, they want you to be a devrel person. See, and that is, uh, I've seen a lot, is that companies are trying to not spend as much money. So this is what ended up happening. But what if you're somebody who's like, yeah, but I, I want to do good and I want to be someone who becomes a strategist. That's why we're talking about this stuff. It's like, okay, yeah. would you like to build your strategy? Let's talk about metrics. And sometimes metrics matter, sometimes they're vanity. But at first, if all you have is vanity, that'll get you going for a quarter. Yeah. But be planning the real metrics that matter. The real ones and like how do i know the metrics matter and the answer is ask your c-suite what do you want to see what will in two years why will you be like i'm so glad we hired a devrel person i'm so glad we hired a devrel team what would make you say that and they will always tell you because they had to make the decision to create the budget for you to even be there so if you're not getting it directly from your marketing lead or your product person go to the c-level and say why is this important to you and what would make you accept? And they'll tell you. And then you can decide, is that something that you could create a strategy for, even with guidance, and reach out, because we're happy to help and talk to you for free. And there's lots of people that will also do paid guidance to um, become a better strategist in DevRel, but honestly, just ask people who are executing it well, not people who are just doing it, but people who you feel, I like what Twilio is doing, or I like what Pieces is doing, I like what ArcGen is doing. Go talk to their leads and say, how did you determine what metrics mattered to you? Because we're all a community in ourselves. That's DevRel right. people. We are a community. We want to help and support each other. Yeah. So we would answer those questions. We would work with you yes. to help you. Yes. And so sometimes it is DevRel's job to help the company get metrics that they never thought of. And sometimes it's your job to help, if it's a brand new company, reach out to the other companies that are doing it. And, and then you can qualify that saying, well, I've never done strategy. I have done execution. But... I talked to the people at NGOC, I talked to the people here, and then I went to KCDC, and I saw 
what those DevRel teams are doing. And so you can qualify your own strategy by saying, this is what more, please do more than one. This is, <laughs> this is what Microsoft is doing, but they are Microsoft, which means they are one of the largest in the world and they have a lot of resources when they choose to use them. And sometimes they don't. <laughs> So, oh, that brings back so many problems. <laughs> yes. And it's okay. I want I, selfishly. I would like everybody's purse strings to open. Yes. Because remember, so going back to being a, an organizer, we don't make money. This is like a community conference. Mm -hmm. um, we cannot exist for you all without our sponsors. And our sponsors, oftentimes, will come to us because the developer relations people say we should be at that conference. So we rely on our relationships so that we can make our tickets very inexpensive for you to come to learn 15 tracks an hour polyglot and, and have that happen. Some conferences are not. They're much bigger pay to play and it will be very expensive to do. And I get that. If you can't justify to your department why you should be there, do an experiment. Say, let me just go and hold a happy hour or let me just go and talk to people over lunch at a table and ha be like, I will do the AI table or I'll do this and just be the conversation starter. And the only cost to you is my ticket to go and maybe stay in a hotel room for that. And see if you can say, well, it could cost us this much, but at least start there. Mm -hmm. And then if they start seeing metrics you can gather that way, and then they say, ah, oh, but if we were like this other booth, they got way more qualified leads because they actually had more than one person on the booth that could catch you they it was very obvious what the demos were they had more resources and which meant they got better and sometimes the only way you can do it is is start grassroots yourself and develop relations and just start collecting something mm -hmm. and vanity metrics if that's all you've got vanity meaning their number of eyeballs with that again could be a spam bot you don't know yeah. it's a person uh, start there and then go right but how many people are looking at that and then signing up for account that's an easy one Mm -hmm. to do how many people are signing up for account but then never use it yep. that's another that's another metric and if you don't have that metric you need to talk to the engineering team to make sure you have that metric because right. sometimes the engineers don't put that kind of level of tracking in the system yes we've got a million downloads who's using it we don't know what is their stack that was a big problem uh, when we were at Octa for a while is that we had until we had an SDK we just had an API we have no idea what stack they were using which means we didn't know which kind of content to create turns right. out we had a lot of people in Ruby didn't know that so all of our guides missed that mark. And the only way they could track it is if they downloaded the SDK and they're like, well, if they have a Ruby SDK, then they probably are Ruby people and they need mm -hmm. content. And sometimes you just ask them. And finally, that was the answer. When we got ready to sign them up for the API, they said, which is your stack? And then they check a box and they were like, great, now we know. Now we know. And sometimes yeah. it doesn't need to be complicated. You don't want to be complicated. If it's complicated, people drop out. Here's a thousand questions before yeah. you sign up. I'm just going to lie all the way through. But if it's a simple question, what stack do you use? Ruby. Cool. Thanks. And we don't have a Ruby SDK yet, but we'll work on one. I give or, you feedback. Yeah. Or you can just say, great, here are the docs for Ruby. Yeah. Here's the docs for this. And then it actually, they get something for what they give you. Yes. Yeah. Or again, you can you start, you write those docs. Yeah. Generally, writing docs is quite a low lift in terms of piece of work compared to doing a video. So you just write a very quick Ruby doc. And yes. then you put tracking on that, the yeah. analytics, yes. how many people are reading our Ruby docs? Again, that's metrics kind of driving those, those product decisions. So yes, we're seeing it up. Since we had our Ruby docs, we're seeing 10% of um, users are looking at our Ruby docs. Right, let's go all in on Ruby because we've seen from data this is, that this is valuable. Cool. I think we've been going for a while. It's been a very good conversation. I think it's a good point to, to wrap up. Um, I'm guessing the summary of this is talk to your C-suite. Yes. You know, find out what those company metrics are. Find out how you can align to those metrics and the activities you're doing. Find out how you can span across multiple teams so that you're sharing metrics with, with other people. How do you help support the marketing, the sales, the engineering metrics? And how do they help support you? And how do they help support you? And then think about metrics, not just in terms of the big numbers of how many you know, vanity metrics, how many views my video, or how many people look at my docs, but look at those metrics inside your application. How many people are using it? Where, where am I getting that drop off, that lack of developer retention? What experiments can I do with content to fix that developer retention? Um, and then think about the metrics around product feedback that advocate for, we are advocates, not evangelists. So even just the number of issues that we're tracking in GitHub or customer satisfaction, those are important metrics to track. So as we wrap up, any passing words? If you want to get into this space, good luck. It's great fun. Yep.
Definitely. It, yeah. It'll make you stretch in ways you didn't expect. It will. Yes, we do some of everything. And yeah. we are a community of people. You know, DevRels, uh, right. we got into this because we love community. Love community. We are also a community of DevRel people. So there's plenty of online communities you can reach out to. Always get in touch with us if you have questions. We're, we're here to help. So thank you very much. KCDC is a lot of fun. If you've never been to KCDC, highly recommend. It's my second time here. Very much a community-driven conference. You meet a whole lot of great people across a whole lot of different technologies. It's not like a just a Microsoft conference. You get yeah. some of everything here. Um, really friendly and it's community driven it's not for profit so please come along buy a ticket sponsor the event and you'll have a great time so thank you for watching